The U.S. Secret Service is the world's most elite protection force, and it's at the cutting edge of investigating and solving the most complex cybercrime on the planet today. It's no surprise that to join the Secret Service, there's an insane amount of training and leveling up of your skills, recognizing and stopping social engineering, your emotional intelligence, psychology, you name it, since your role is at the top of national security. But did you know that you can become a Secret Service agent even after starting your career in a totally different field? And it doesn't have to be law or law enforcement. You can go from being a high school science teacher even to protecting the most important resource of data and national security we have in the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. president. I'll prove it to you. We have not one, but two episodes unlike anything you've ever seen or heard before guaranteed. For the first time ever, we provide insider access to an elite U.S. Secret Service agent, Mr. Paul Ekloff, who has been gracious enough to sit down with us for these two episodes. Paul was a top Secret Service agent for 23 years. He served our country 14 years of that. He served our country at the highest level, protecting the U.S. president, from President Clinton all the way through President Trump. And he currently serves in leadership at LexisNexis. Today, we see the U.S. Secret Service in action, and we discuss how it all intersects physical security, AI, espionage, national security, and cybersecurity, and how all of this ties national security to cybersecurity, how it affects our daily lives right here in the heart of North America. This is the story of Paul Ekloff, and we bring you behind the scenes of the U.S. Secret Service in action. Come join us as we dive deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Interviewing top technology leaders from around the world and sharing true cybercrime stories to raise awareness. From the creators of Vigilance, the newest global technology newsletter, translating cyber news into business language we all understand so please help us keep this going by subscribing for free to our youtube channel and downloading our podcast episodes on apple and spotify so we can continue to bring you more of what matters this is cybercrime junkies and now the show I can only imagine where this conversation is going to go. So welcome, everybody, to Cybercrime Junkies. Today is an episode unlike all episodes. We are joined by a, seriously, a living legend. So Paul Ekloff <laughs> was a United States Secret Service agent. That's a United States Secret Service agent who's willing to talk to me, which is Phenomenal, right there, and then we well, should we just have, end the show with that sentence, and that's it. But uh, you were, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I get my dates wrong, but or if I do terrible at math. But as I look at it, it looks like you were a Secret Service agent for 23 years, and 10 of those were spent, or even possibly 14 of those were spent protecting the most important people on the planet. And before that, what's really interesting is that you are a high school teacher. So today you're one of the top leaders on the planet today in information security, working with LexisNexis Risk Solutions. So Paul, Mr. Eckloff, thank you so much for joining. Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm sorry to interrupt you there. I just wanted to tell you the reason that I was willing to talk to you is the Secret Service needs to speak to you about something, but we'll talk about it. Oh, that. Jesus. <laughs> I'm from the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> that's that's uh, great. Way to like just as soon as you said it too, like I knew it was a joke, but like the hair on the back of my neck went up and I was like started to have an anxiety attack. I'm like, oh man, that is not what I want to hear today. Not Today's fun. been a day. So, <laughs> Understood. No, thanks for having me. The the work that you do on cybercrime junkies to distill these concepts that are so incredibly complex. And honestly, they they, they don't need to be. But that reminds me of my high school biology work that if to 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 explain things and it's not dumbing it down, honestly, it's it's making it digestible because they are such critically important issues. And cyber crime is is it, it affects all aspects of every American's life, whether they want to admit it or not, or think it's the realm of nerds. Um, and I will ask you to maybe insert a nerd alert flash with the klaxon from Star Trek or Star Wars noise, because I don't want to alienate half your listeners. Um, 
when I speak because I, that's the rabbit hole. I that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Well, thank you for that. I mean, look, and I'm, I'm humbled to hear that from you. Um, I mean, look, I think it's important, you know, I think it's important to do even outside of cybersecurity. I think just technology initiatives, digital transformation, things like that, even business owners aren't necessarily technical, but they know they need things to happen. And in today's world, for them to happen, technology is involved. With cybersecurity, we have to make sure that we can do those things without being torpedoed, right? Without uninterrupt, like unanticipated harm coming from us. And the fact that we use technology for everything isn't great for for crime fighting, right? I mean, it's really it's really a lot a uh, lot more difficult to police because every time we get online, we enter the you know uh, a territory that is no longer Kansas anymore. Absolutely, and we also have to realize, and this was something that, as a Secret Service person who you know could shut down a city for an NSSE for a security event. We also can't move the pendulum so far that our systems are not accessible to the users. And we also can't burn the boats. Cybercrime is digital piracy, but you don't outlaw boats. Right. They're built by governments. They're built by individuals. You can innovate. They've been around. Um, you can't you, you can't be extreme. There's that there's there's a balance there between privacy and security and I'm not a believer in absolutism. I think that there's a spectrum of all these things or a, Venn, a very complex Venn diagram I can't understand. But you look at that's just how society seems to go. Think about it with one, and this is sad, I'm going to get a lot of hate mail, but one myopic just turtle. Just to me. Send him, send his <laughs> hate mail to me. Send and him. Paul and I will get together with Brett Johnson and we'll go through your mail. That's oh, fine. And you don't want to run afoul of Brett. I can guarantee <laughs> no, you that. The Secret Service not, tried man. it, learned the hard way. Uh, that guy knows more than, than, than anyone in this. But think about one myopic turtle jammed a straw in its nose. One sea turtle jammed a straw in its nose, and now we all use sippy cups at Starbucks. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying single-use plastics aren't a problem, but how do I know this turtle didn't have a drug problem? I mean, it doesn't even have thumbs, and it got this straw in its nose. You don't look at a, a junkie on the street and go, you know, oh, well, we're gonna, just going to have to ban syringes. I mean... I, maybe that's a counter. Maybe that's not a popular opinion. I think that turtle had problems. But that's I, I yeah, I think that turtle grew up in the in w w without the right without the right parenting guidance or without some some belief in a higher cause. But the you know, mothers just dump the eggs on the beach, and then the little guys have to get I into the water. The, yeah. I see the turtle at my twelve step meetings. He's doing okay. <laughs> He's doing a little better today. That's awesome. Yeah, his eyes are still all teary with the salt water. Yeah. He is. He's his, his shell's a little drier <laughs> now, little but he's, he's doing well. Good. So, Good to know. Let's talk about your origin story, Paul. So, um, if you can't tell, Paul should have a stand up show. Which honestly, a stand up comedian who used to be a high school teacher and a U.S. Secret Service person, that is a show. Like, I'm just letting you know, if you're ever thinking about it, I will manage you. I will be there. I will I will set the dates for you. Like, that is a phenomenal. Like, think of the material. Oh, but my God. You like that, aren't you like the wrestling uh, manager, the old guy that had the mullet and the, the tennis oh. racket? Oh. You know, I forget his name. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I want someone like that that can. can yeah, you. that's. You know, I, well, I've, I am the Forrest Gump. Of, of professionals. I've literally had almost from scuba diving for fish for aquariums around the world in college. I was going to be the next Jacques Cousteau, um, as you can see. Okay, so back up. So th that's what I want to ask you. Like when you were a kid, and when I want a kid, I'm not saying like when you're six years old, but like when you were a young adult going through school, like did you know, like I want to protect the president of the United States? Like if somebody goes after that guy, I'm jumping in front of him. I'm checking out his <laughs> car. Like, is that what you were thinking? Or like you wanted to be like a scuba diver, right? Like what? How, how did, let, let's go back to what you were thinking when you were, because I try and explain this to my kids that are that age now and say, it's okay. Just learn along the way because 20 years from now, you're going to be doing something. You have no idea what you're doing. You can completely pivot. I was raised in a military family around the world. Okay. Um, I did see President Reagan from about 400 yards away when he recommissioned the New Jersey in Long Beach. 
Very uh, cool. Thought that, thought that was cool. Um, he wasn't a and, bad president, I'll tell you. But let's not go there. Let's not. We, we go, well, he played a Secret Service agent in one of his most famous movies. I know. Bancroft, Code of the Secret Service. I know. Um, I wanted to be, I was into biology and fish and fish tanks. I was going to be the next Jacques Cousteau. Wow. Um, but that's the lesson to your kids or to anybody, really, is that you can pivot if your interests or your, your life has taken you in a different direction. I became an educator because as a scientist, I don't want to say I was lazy, but I, you got to know your limitations. That's another life lesson. Mm -hmm. I yeah. realized that my knowledge and ability of marine biologist, and in order to feed your family as a marine biologist, you literally have to eat the fish you're studying. Like if you want to train flipper, you got to share the bait because it's not a highly paid thing. I right. realized if I could be a teacher, because I, I like to talk and tell stories and you can judge whether they're any good. Um, I, if I influence two kids, to be right. scientists, I could double the impact I could have had. And so it was sort of profound for me, not that I was a very profound college student, because I wasn't, I had a mullet. And now because I went to University of Miami, I had a lot of skin cancer, but I pivoted to education and became a teacher. I was a teacher. Do we have photos of you having a mullet back in the day? They, they may exist. And if one appears on this show, um, you'll hear from my lawyers. That would be but phenomenal. I if I could just insert, I'll use AI to regenerate one. I'll send you one. It actually is kind of funny and I'm proud of it. That that thing looked good, but this is what God does to mullets. He's like, oh, you want hair on your back? Now that's the only place you can grow it. And that's just, hilarious. Yeah. Um, so, so how did you, okay, so you were, which makes sense for that transition to go from that, that interest to teaching science in high school. Makes, that's a normal transition. We could see that one coming. How did you go from being, because we've had other teachers that became FBI agents, uh, uh, Darren Mott and uh, Nancy um, Aguilar, uh, like okay. they, they both transitioned into the FBI from being high school. I still was blown away by that story. How did you go from high school teacher to secret service? Did somebody like tap you and go, come here, like we have a plan no. for you? Or was it like you applied and you went for it and and i want to know why like it's the story is i was teaching biology at the time in rural georgia and, and struggling to reach what they call the middle 50. they're not brilliant they're not going to go to college they're not they're not special needs in that sense but mm -hmm. these were just average just um, good good americans you teach them a science it was applied science and the mm -hmm. county bought me this applied science set of paperback books and it was like a month on water you can only talk about water or this is physics. And I was just so bored and being, you know, arrogant enough. I told the principal, I said, these are terrible. And he said, well, if you think you're so smart, write your own. And I went, okay. is that an option? So at the time, those Dr. Michael Bodden videos on HBO and those types of things, autopsy, it interested me how science was used to solve crime. So I thought if you want to get their interest, you don't tell them about water. You talk about these shows that they're watching where, you know, nothing but a torso is found in a lake and how right. they get the, the, the different things. So I studied forensic science myself. I ordered books. I may or may not have called publishers and said that I was a forensic science instructor. And so they sent me books and things. Um, and I stayed a chapter ahead of the students. We did a unit on forensic entomology, you know, ballistics, um, blood stain pattern analysis. All while, you were, all while you were a science teacher. While I was teaching biology, I got them to allow me to teach this applied science as Absolutely. criminology, criminalistics. It's now a four year course it is. in yeah. this county in high school science. They teach whole units on it from this little thing that I started. I mean, we literally would take a chicken from the grocery store and stab it. And then I would put it by the air intake for the math wing, knowing that I could take them out every week and show them the different insects that arrive. Stab mm -hmm. wounds close up but the, they seep fluid. So ants are the first things to arrive and they drink that fluid. So if you go to a, a course and you see, you know, and if there's a, a real forensic entomologist who wants to correct me, you can see the little ants and there. That's where the stab wounds are that you can't see. And then different insects arrive at different stages. If you pull off a uh, fly at a certain instar larvae, you know, it's been there a week. My plan by putting it by the air intake for the math wing, which was rather evil, uh, very Mr. Burns-ish, was that it wouldn't smell real great in the building, so they'd send someone out to check it. He'd be disgusted and kick the body. Then I could take him out and go, these species of insect aren't found in the sunlight, so this body was moved. 
it was devious and it worked out. Oh, you know? somebody so, moved the body. Somebody moved the body and you could tell by the types of insects. Well, so it was those kinds of things that a 10th grader and 11th graders, they were fascinated by. We're learning about, you know, the angle and, you know, hydrophilic. And so hydrophilic you started to bodies. get into the, yeah, so you started to get into that, which is a definite precursor to law enforcement. Well, and specifically a unit on security paper. I mm -hmm. came upon a unit on how security paper is made to prevent counterfeit money. And I would have them design their own currency, poster board size, so I didn't get in trouble, and draw it and had to include three security features, whether that was microprinting, watermarks. Mm -hmm. The hologram, changing, whatever. Hologram right. type things. Yeah. That, and in doing that, I learned and studied about the Secret Service, and it struck me at the time that I should apply. It fascinated. I was either going to get a degree in forensic science or go in federal law enforcement. And that that's what landed when I called the office in 96 in Atlanta, they were in the middle of the Olympics and didn't have time. I took their test and being a huge nerd did, did rather well on it. And the rest is they say, I got to walk through history with. That's phenomenal. Years. And you served with, I mean, you were in the Oval Office or on presidential detail for 14 years or so? Yes, I started in 05 under President Bush 43 uh, on the president's detail. I started in 98 under President Clinton, but starting on PPD in 05 and eventually when I finally left, it's around 2019, um, I, I progressed through the years doing just about every assignment um, and left as the detail leader or assistant special agent in charge of President Trump and President Obama for almost four years as an ASAC. Best job in the Secret Service. Wow, and so you were traveling the world. You were, you, you and I have spoken previously, obviously, not on air, but um, yeah, I mean, you've had, uh, I, I think you said it once, like you, you were in all these different countries throughout the Middle East. Some of them are, you know, very dangerous for Americans to be at all in one day, but yet getting online scares you more now. Well, I would say to the average American, and it is funny because I've told people that now that I'm a, a you know, a director of public relations for just an amazing company that works with government agencies. Um, I'm far less comfortable than I was at the presidential palace in Kabul, where our motorcade route had been hit with IEDs the day before, um, or wearing, uh, carrying a gun in Ramallah in the West Bank, not to step on toes with the political thing that they're going now. I was far more comfortable in that situation because it's a world that I understand. I understand mm -hmm. that there's only so much you control. And if I'm going to get blown to hell, which is probably precisely where I'm going, it, that that's out of my control. But this keyboard to the other 300 and so million Americans is the most dangerous place they will go. And that led my research to things. You talk about digesting things when you and the topic of this show. It fascinates me because you hear the word cyber. Right. Most people tune out because it's the realm of nerds or Cyber. It is. They think they think all hackers are like kids in hoodies, cracking code, drinking Red Bull, living in their mom's basement. And it's like it is it is organized crime like it is the movie The Godfather. Like when it covers every aspect like, of our lives, well, it most is people have no idea where cyber. Do you know where cyber even comes from? No, I didn't go down that rabbit hole. What where's the word cyber come from? I was fascinated. People instantly hear it and they just How do I not know this? Please, uh, I will edit this out probably. <laughs> like, how do I, I've, of course I do, Paul. Let me tell you the history, the uh, epitomology of the word. No, I, I don't know. So tell me. <laughs> Trigger, nerd alert. Once again, klaxon sound from Star Trek. <laughs> it fascinated me, so I looked into it. Cyber was first coined cybernetics in 1948. The study uh -huh. of animal and machine control. It comes from the Greek word, which is 2,500 years old, kybernetis, which means rudder, pilot, or control. So cybercrime, what is cybercrime about? It's about taking control. And what's cybersecurity? Taking control back. It's so simple, right. and beautiful, a concept, but that it's a 2,500 year old concept. Um, and like the first and technical we have the origin cyber... of species right here on cybercrime junkies today. That well, was far, th <laughs> yeah. And I today, way low on the evolutionary tree. Paul swings from his family tree, but I've seen my 23 man. It, it's not pretty. So, so you bring up a good point. Um, and that is your experience was with physical security. Mm 
yeah. and that it naturally involved, I mean, back in 98, not to diss on the technology of 98, right? But back in 98, cybercrime and cybersecurity wasn't what it was today. And the realm of physical security was clearly paramount. Now you have both, right? Now the realm of, I mean, we see ransomware attacks leading to deaths, Yes. Literally, right? Proximate cause of a death are certain ransomware attacks. So you're seeing the digital criminal activity directly affecting the physical realm now. So the physical security and cybersecurity, walk us through what you see to be some of the biggest dangers for Americans, Canadians, Australian, you know, the, the Western civilization. No, absolutely. And at its core, the biggest threat are nation state supported actors. Certainly. But when you, when but you most look of us at don't have to, most organizations, most people don't have to worry about that. I mean, they, they do like, you know, we always talk about the largest healthcare breach was Anthem. And, and we always ask people like how much, you know, how much do you think all that data sold on the dark web? Right. And, and then if, they're always shocked to find out it never was because it was actually espionage. It was a nation state. A absolutely. And, well, most of these things, what are interesting, your biggest cyber actors with China, Russia, mm -hmm. North Korea, and Iran, the average person does have to be concerned about it. The interplay or interconnectedness of cybersecurity, physical, physical security, and national security, they're really inseparable. Even the average person, when you look at whether it's consumer confidence or financial crimes and money being stolen, they're all interconnected. Um, and at the end, no matter how strong your security, what we're finding is the majority of these hacks, the vast majority, are someone letting them in. Like, I, you think about a castle defense. I'm still but blown I, away by it. I'm still it, blown away by it. Yeah, I okay. love the castle analogy, right? Because, I, I mean, when you think about whenever I'm in meetings in my regular job, my real job, right, and, and we're talking to people, they're always talking about, infrastructure and and hardening and everything else and i'm like you do know that none of this is going to matter if mrs buttermaker over on the third floor lets them in right absolutely we have to, we have to focus on the people to me yes. like that's the most important thing isn't it the hackers hack people yeah there's very little of the old school you know injection sql hacking it still right. exists like war crimes are war games where they put their phone and they did phone freaking, which is another funny story. Did you know that Jobs and Wozniak got their first business making illegal phone freaking yes, machines? I actually I mean, do. And that's that was the they book. They didn't make right enough money there. on it. Yeah, the book, <laughs> the book about it is right up on my shelf. They didn't yeah. make enough money doing it, so they pivoted to something that made more money. Yeah, but I'm I'm drawn to like uh, like Monty Python. They come up there clacking their coconuts and ask to get in the castle, and he says, "Return, and I shall tell you a second time." Well, that's one knows, of my favorite movies, and when my daughter watches this, she hates that movie. So I'm well, so yes. glad that Paul Ekloff actually cited Monty Python and the Holy Grail. We'll have links to it in the show notes. I still fear bunnies but it's they, they scare the dickens out of they're them. terrible they go right for the throat I but know. If someone's behind him tapping that guy on the shoulder going well i already opened the gate and the key right. to security is have the moat have the drawbridge have the portcullis mm -hmm. so that if there's one human error hopefully second and what i really found fascinating you had a brilliant episode about the psychology of social engineering like i mean you guys were talking about the amygdala and the lizard brain and all of these things what i find interesting is all of those triggers that lead to, to social engineering attacks are really, they parallel the seven deadly sins. The right. Bible taught us about social engineering. If you're talking about lust or sloth or wrath or greed or envy, and I'm trying to have a little note to remember the other ones, uh, pride, every one of them plays upon. Let me look at my diary. I think I've committed all of them. Unfortunately. <laughs> you're just hacking the human condition. You might also want to read Dante and see which level you'll be living at with yeah, uh, which has be the best cocktail bar. But yeah. these huge, they're hacking the human condition. And, but right. you, you, I often get accused of, well, you're victim blaming. What's the difference between victim blaming and victim educating? Because it really right. are humans. I'm not shaming them because I've, I get five, phishing emails a day. And when you add that up to phishing, vishing, smishing, 
Now we have quishing where QR codes. You Absolutely. Don't solve, you yep. don't solve any of those by wishing. You solve them by educating so right. that so that you aren't. Oh, that sounds like a great deal. It's not. Or, oh, you're a really smart person. You know, wait a minute. That's how you lured me on this podcast with all that hyperbolic. Yeah. When you think the about it, not my you first are, rodeo in social you engineering. Are, you are devious. But what I'm social engineering better. is marketing. Right. The sales cycle. How do you how do you think really you look is. in your new your new Corvette? Well, it really is social engineer. The you know studying marketing like I had before, and then studying social engineering. I'm like the tactics are like they use different words to describe the efforts that are made. They're identical. I mean, it's it's identical. They are identical. It's because. Everything involved. If Black Julie Friday sales. You know what I mean? <laughs> Black Friday sales. Like all that right. stuff is designed to act with with urgency. It's designed yes. to invoke emotions and, and have your amygdala hijack. It's it's how the humans are wired. We're, you know, we when that happens, it's our fight or flight. It's like a woolly mammoth has entered our village and we have yes. to and we have to fight or we have to run away. And it's we and when that happens the brain, the frontal cortex, actually shuts off. All of the yes. all of the scans of people when they're undergoing social engineering, it shows the front part of the brain, the the the, the neocortex shuts off, which means you can't remember your training. You can't recognize that, oh my God, I shouldn't click on this. Like they do that sense of urgency for a reason. Well, and it's fascinating because it brings us back full circle to the inventor of cybernetics in nineteen forty eight which was about feedback loops in systems, mm. animals and in machines. And I, I, I hate to break it to, we talked about, uh, you know, the Darwin's or, origin of species. Uh, I hate to break it to them, but we're, we're animals and we're subject to all of these things. How do you get someone to make a decision that is counter to their own interest? That's marketing. Mm. Like, I don't need a new Maserati, but I sure would look cool in one. Um, but it, that would if, not if be as a family man. Marketing yeah. works. If people don't think marketing works, right? When you go to the grocery store for X and you come out with more than X, marketing has worked. Absolutely. Right? And it's like, time to the music. Yes. The shade of the lighting item placement. Absolutely. Look at, Crate and, look at Crate and Barrel. I, I, I remember studying uh, how how like uh, Kmart back in the day had the exact same glass by the exact same manufacturer created from this exact same manufacturing plant in Alabama. And they put it on their shelves with the fluorescent lighting on the metal shelves and it sold for X and not that many sold Crate and Barrel had indirect studio lighting glistening on balsam wood right with w right at eye level and they sold like 10 times as much for like four times the price like well, it's, market it's, just, it's the same thing like you go into a dress this shirt looked really cool in the dressing room i'm looking <laughs> at it now and i look like a you know a, a third world doctor but it's but when this airs it'll look great Oh, I look we'll put it in post production. <laughs> It'll just, don't you, you worry. Replace it with something like a really nice, tasteful sweater. We can do any. <laughs> we'll get into deep fakes in just a second. Um, um, well, yeah, whoops, so, so, the cyber crime, though, I just want to add. Yeah, what, what I think is problem. We talk about hacking humans or the psychology of social engineering, um, and then we, the physical security versus the cyber security and how the Secret Service sort of came to it. And I was a bit of a luddite earlier. Like you talked to my brother trying to get me to use a TiVo, or when. The Secret okay. Service came to us and said, we have this new critical systems protection program, and you're going to have to let those people in, and they're going to prevent the hackers from messing with your protective site. Us old knuckleheads were like, oh, no, they're going to turn the lights off. It's far more ominous. And mm -hmm. society has a tendency to make hackers the heroes. Watch a movie and find that they're on both sides, but it's always that cool. Now there's not a, a, a procedural crime drama where there isn't some cool hip guy with cool rings and braces and he's kind of quirky and he's at the keyboard and he can hack anything. He can solve anything. We look at these people, they're lionized because of the, once again, the human condition and the story of either the anti-hero or the David and Goliath. Yep. Asymmetrical warfare. We Americans, you know, we view, uh, the British hated the fact that Americans were about asymmetrical warfare and guerrilla force shooting from the trees, aim small, miss small, you know, like from the, the Patriot. Yep. But then it was used pretty effectively against us in other wars like Vietnam 
Mm-hmm. And now when you look at, we see, we see cyber actors as somehow heroes, like, and this is going to get political, but like Edward Snowden is no hero to me. Dozens of people lost their lives for your cute notion of, and somewhat childish notion of privacy and transparency. Do you need some tr- privacy and transparency? Absolutely. And what's the smallest unit of cybercrime? It's data. And I, I love when people, I don't love, I actually lose sleep over it, but people just want to ban all data. We, you, data's wrong. People who sell are evil. Data is the only way modern commerce works. Just like you don't ban right. boats for piracy because it was global right. shipping, it was the global economy. You can't ban data because it is now the global economy. It allows your Uber to know where to go and Amazon to said the right thing, people to get affordable insurance. And we can't healthcare. function without knowing the data. So and it has need- to be sold and transacted for us to get it. And you can regulate it, but right. much like other arguments, it should be controlled, and it is. But if you ban it or you say law enforcement can't use it, criminals don't care about your laws, which is kind of the definition of criminal. Um, right. So you've got to find right legal there, responsible what, ways. What to is the de- – like cyber criminals, they're early adopters, aren't yes, they? Yes, the earliest of adopters. So when you think of that that maturity, that, that – um, the, the the scale of early adopters, the the laggards at the end that still want landlines, right, uh, and dial up and and it, it, cyber criminals are right at the epitome, right in the beginning, aren't they? They absolutely are because once again, their motivators are still in the seven deadly sins. They have a greed or an envy or a wrath right. that they use those same inspirations within them to target other people, uh, like physician heal thyself. They, they're they self, they're, they're very self-aware in many respects. Although Brett Johnson will teach you very quickly that many of them in the space are not very self-aware, but they're bragging on telegram or going on his podcast as a liar or all the, like I, he teaches me more than any college class I've ever had within five minutes, much like Absolutely. your show breaking the things down. We um, do. And we just, we just interviewed him last week. So that episode, I think that episode will air either right after, or right before this one. So people will know exactly what we're talking about. Absolutely astounding. But when you look at those early adopters, it didn't used to be that way. There is an, um, a convergence of technology that has occurred where it used to be that the governments only could wield the tank and, and rule the world. But now the tank can be rendered useless with a few keystrokes. And when you look at that, you can go into a Best Buy or order on Amazon, if there are any Best Buys anymore, uh, and, and get a keyboard that's, or a laptop that's more powerful than some government systems. Like in the pandemic, many government systems still ran on COBOL, a language no one can write anymore. And isn't they stole that, isn't a that trillion dollars from the U.S. government. We've become numb to cyber criminals because we think hacking is cute. And we've become numb to the numbers. I posted on LinkedIn, I do that a little too much, but I never even realized the word numb was in numbers. But hey, once again, as a huge nerd flash, I saw that a trillion dollars was likely stolen of the four and a half trillion that was doled out. But once again, people go billion, trillion, what's the difference? So let, let's provide some context there because I did want to ask you about that. So let's, let's part of cyber crime is crime when you think of fraud, right? Not necessarily cyber criminal gangs like black hat that we talked to which you and i'll get into in just a second but we're talking about like fraud and there was a lot of massive amounts of fraud that arose from the pandemic when the government wanted to help organizations they wanted to help yeah. small businesses like the the local in town restaurant that had to shut down because of the pandemic they wanted to provide some relief so the intent was good Absolutely. but there's a lot of things that happened with the government the execution is horrible and so well, what happened here? Like what there were a lot of loans given to people that didn't need it, like the Oprah Winfrey's or the 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 jet setting group, no offense to Oprah per se, but like like that group and then they didn't have to pay it back, but then some of the smaller organizations did have to pay it back, but then a whole bunch of it was just stolen. Walk us through high level kind of what all happened because a lot of Americans have no idea that this even happened. Well, and it's astounding. They have no ideas of the, of the impact or how it's even caused. There was so much PPP fraud in certain major cities. It what is PPP? Home. It's the Paycheck Protection Program, yep. which was to provide these small loans to businesses um, that could be paid back or forgiven. 
And there was, I think there was around $900 billion, I think it's 800 and something billion dollars in change, billion with a B, assigned to it. By my studies, $795 billion of that was lost to fraud, waste, and abuse. And there's a difference between those three things. But they were intended, and unfortunately, people get into not just victim blaming, or they want to blame these. The term bureaucrat has become an epithet, and it is not. People look at Secret Service agents, and I mean, you're unbelievably kind and hyperbolic intro. Oh, well, they're, they're heroes. Or police are heroes. Well, they're bureaucrats. Why are the, pe the, the, the hardworking men and women of the Department of Labor or the, the, the USDA, they are trying to do right as well. They're sometimes hindered by poor political decisions, mm -hmm. poor systems, rules that are foisted upon them. Um, generally, that all comes from Congress or poor oversight. But what happened during the pandemic was a problem was recognized and a solution. The answer was it just has to get out, get out quickly. Programs used to have checks and balances, whether that was identity verification, asset verification. Um, but the drive to expediency, the drive to yes. get it out fast, broke a lot of maybe safeguards in built in the system. Almost and, all of them. Yeah. And it just and it didn't need to be that way. Uh, Michael Horowitz, yeah. the brilliant head of the Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, the PRAC, has even said you could have had what they call in the industry friction. And I always tell my mm -hmm. to stop using because the average person doesn't get that. If I have to enter my name and a password, many government officials say, well, that's too much. It'll slow them down. Well, criminals realize it really quick. When you outlay $4.5 trillion, um, people, criminals go where the money is. So they're going to go there. They were defrauded. Well, $4.5 trillion. Let's, let's talk about cyber fraud by the numbers a little bit. So $4.5 trillion was issued through the pandemic in an effort to kind of help the economy and help the people. And it did. It did in a lot of it ways. Did. It certainly did. I know lots of people that received it and used it and used it for the right reasons and paid it back even. Um, and then some didn't have to. So, and But it right. seemed like there was, what were the rules on having to pay it back? Is it a case by case basis or what? Because I see people at all the different sizes and industries, some who did have to pay back, some who didn't. To me, I can't make up any rhyme or reason. Well, there were forgivable loans under PPP, unforgivable loans under the EIDL. Right. Honestly, I don't even think I can tell you what that, the two ones out of the SBA. Um, there were just a lot of rules that if you had money, you could navigate. If you were a criminal, it didn't matter. Certainly right. the, the you know, once again, I don't want to get enemies, but the, the Oprah Winfrey's and the Kanye West and the Tom Brady's and the Bruce Springsteen's who took PPP loans clearly didn't need them. Did they violate the law? No. Um, but that's where you start to get like in this, this prison of two ideas or the bias of the binary of a, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but a mala in se versus a mala prohibit a law, things mm -hmm. that are inherently evil and wrong and things that are wrong because they're prohibited. And there, there is a, there is an overlap there though, because society can change its minds on things. Cybercrime clearly and its intent falls under mala prohibita, but you right. can, as you said, a ransomware attack on a hospital or a children's hospital, which is unconscionable to people like us, is done every day, and they've actually returned to it. But the fraud that was lost in the amounts and the impact, home prices went up. Fraud in the SNAP program actually means food costs 15 to 20 percent more. So by right. trying to, I mean, no one can argue that the hungry deserve food, and we should we should provide these services. But there's no correlation between the amount spent and the people fed. Criminals take from it. I don't want to highlight that one, but any number of them. And when you look at the numbers, I'm astounded because people, you hear a billion, a trillion, what's the difference? And I probably said this too much lately, but there's an enormous difference. A billion seconds ago was 1992 and my glorious mullet that we talked about. A trillion <laughs> seconds ago was the woolly mammoth you brought up. It's 29,000 years ago. That's the difference between a billion and a trillion. That is a great analogy. So when we talk about the difference between a billion and a trillion, whenever you're looking at numbers, it's a great, a that's thousand a thousand times now. So if one is 30 years ago, one's 30,000 times years, years wow. ago. And it astounds me. But as we talk, I've pivoted mainly to fraud because that's mainly where I focus. But cyber crime in general, you know, these tools that were developed, some of the earliest, cyber, well, the first cyber attack, I think, was before any of it existed, like 1841. But Correct. you look at the other ones, they were tools that weren't intended to cause harm. The first creeper worm was supposed to creep around the internet and figure out its size. 
but it went well, a little yeah, crazy. And then back in the 80, even back in the 80, in more modern times, back in the 80s, there was the somebody that was at a, um, I forgot, I think it was uh, Health and Human Services, or, or it was like an AIDS conference, and they sent out the discs, mm-hmm. right? Like, here's this, and it encrypted like 20,000 computers. And I'm like, there were 20,000 people in the 80s that had computers? I didn't even know that. <laughs> right. But, 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 I mean, it was the, like the ransomware, like they, or whatever, the, the, the virus spreading, the malware, they were doing that 40 years ago, 50 years ago, hundreds of years ago, yes. right? Yes. Like it's, yes. it's just leveraging advances in technology for malintent, really. Yes. And that one was to prevent piracy. So, but right. it caused problems. Like you start with good intent. And this is to, uh, was a thought that, um, the director of the Secret Service took away from a meeting with a hacker, kind of that one man's uh, malware is another man's software. It's kind right. of like, you know, you can build or destroy with a hammer. Um, and then you can start getting into other debates I don't want to bring up because they're you know politically sensitive. But you look at these right. cyber attacks and the bleed over to national security or physical security is astounding. Like one, I think one of the first... Well, it bleeds over macro and it bleeds over micro, right? You have cyber criminals and the ones that are in the news are the ones that are going after either government entities, organizations, hospitals, private industry, names, brands that we recognize. And those are the ones that we talk about often. Those are the ones that are in the news. But then on the macro level, you've got cyber criminals, uh, you know, running you know, human trafficking and child predating predators and, and, and that's at the micro level. And then at the macro level, we have national security. And and both both of those extremes is where it really matters, at least to us. Like people don't understand either. Like uh, the solar winds hack, you know, that's a huge example of, of a supply chain attack. Yes. Well, how did it start and why? Well, it turns out, and I'm probably going to get into something I don't have any special knowledge, but from looking at it, you know, history doesn't doesn't repeat itself. Observational knowledge. Everything Observational that we knowledge. gather up um, through OSINT. Through OSINT. Solar Winds was was a Russian-born cyber espionage attack on the United States government. It wasn't intended to, you know, through the Orion software to impact businesses necessarily, except like in Russia and China, the state and the nation's interests are 100% aligned. In America, we have this separation of, you know, not only church and state, but everything is separated. It was intended, and you haven't heard a lot about its effect on government, not an immense amount on its attack on government, but emails disappeared from the Department of Defense. Emails disappeared from the Department of Homeland Security. You haven't heard a lot about it because I think it had a greater effect than people are aware. They went in there and they were able to, to reverse some of the things, but it's possible some of those things still exist. And that gets down to dwell time. The average cyber attack only has a dwell time of, I don't know, is it hours? 48 hours dwell time for it? During the time of the actual launch, yeah. But then there's also the getting inside a network and moving around and gathering up all of the all of the research and kind of espionage that's done before. And that's anywhere between four to six months still. So and, it, and it, it, it all kind of depends. When solar winds, they were inside 14 months before they, yeah, they really did anything. Go. And yep. I mean, the Buffalo Bill running around in the skin of all these companies in the government. Um, the and and you've got to wonder there. with, I mean, you know, they had systems, they had detection systems. How did they not, I mean, did they not have a SOC monitoring for anomalies, doing threat hunting? How did they not see it? But, you know, that's a different story. Well, they didn't deploy the malware and they actually were inside for probably at least six months before they did a test injection. Right. And what they, from my reading, what they did was normally the communication back to the, the kybernetis or the controller in these attacks is done outside or it's an anomalous signal that can be detected by these socks. The SolarWinds hack was so devious because the Russian, I don't know whether it was, or what are the two main ones, uh, Cozy Bear and... Yep. Um, One's the government, one, or one's intelligence, one's military. There's a couple of bears there. Mm-hmm. Um, it was hidden as normal network traffic. So it's uh, right. it, they were able to disguise it amidst normal things, you know, a, a very, uh, very Odyssean hanging to the bottom of the sheep as it walked out of the cave, um, of, you know, of the, uh, of the monster on that island. But 
you look at these things in the way that these governments are able to do it, whether it's, um, you know, Iran or these one of the more devious uses of these cyber attacks. Obviously, there was a there was a hack of Ukrainian systems in 2015 that they haven't really they've described. They know it's Russia likely, but it probably was a precursor to Crimea, a precursor to what we've seen now. And they even know this really terrifies me in the the the, the heinous Hamas attacks. They actually hacked the warning system that Israeli right. citizens received of incoming missiles so that they wouldn't get any warning of this attack and they would stay where they were when the attackers came in. Yep. I, um, I, I remember reading about that and reporting on that right after it attacked and because people were like, well, why would we worry about, you know, cyber attacks when things like that happen? I'm like, cyber was happening as part of that. Like it's a part of the reason it was so bad physically for the people on the ground is because the cyber defenses were rendered, you know, I mean, there's a lot of countries out there that have a lot of defense systems where Israel is, this isn't a political statement, but where they are, they have some of the best because they have to, right? Yeah. They're surrounded by enemies. So um, they had those warning systems in place. They were just essentially decommissioned right before, right as they launched. Well, and what's even more terrifying is you can talk about active attacks, but when you talk about preemptive attacks, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the word proactive because you either act or you don't, you can't act right. or you do, but that's another etymology. It, it, that's a marketing. Nerd alert, nerd yeah. alert, but that's yeah. marketing. Um, yeah. When you look at countries that are doing preemptive cyber attacks in anticipation of potential conflict, uh, China, has hacked into the infrastructure in Guam because Guam mm -hmm. would be the primary center with its base at Anderson Air Force Base and you have a gotten a bay with the Navy down there. Um, you would be the primary response for the Pacific Fleet during any conflict, you know, any conflict in the South China Sea, Taiwan, any yep. of that. So they've hacked into that. Hearts and minds, it, it, they, they reach into the systems. They, they, and that's, that's another story, but when you look at are the shipping and the infrastructure that would be required for any type of physical conflict, there are these cranes at all the ports that would load the military vessels are all under the you know Internet of Things under Chinese control as far as we know. Stay tuned for part two coming up right now. Well, that wraps this up. Thanks for joining everybody. Hope you got value out of digging deeper behind the scenes of security and cybercrime today. Please don't forget to help keep this going by subscribing free to our YouTube channel at Cybercrime Junkies Podcast and download and enjoy all of our past episodes on Apple and Spotify podcasts so we can continue to bring you more of what matters. This is Cybercrime Junkies, and we thank you for joining us.